In today's video, I'm gonna to cover the topic of my perfect build. This is also to answer a lot of questions I've been getting, people asking me the things that I use and why I use them, so on and so forth. So let's just get right into it. The quad, of course, you guys probably know that I'm flying. I've been sponsored by them for a while now. Absolutely love this quad. It completely changed the game for me. The first time I actually flew this quad, I just had no desire to fly anything else. And that's when I knew that this is the quad I wanted to stick with. The Quad Mula Siren F5 split. The standard one, not the mini. I very much love the mini. As you guys have probably seen, I've put out a few videos in regards to this particular quad. I think it flies great. It's got a slightly smaller wheelbase. It weighs about 30 grams less than this one, so it's a little bit lighter, smaller wheelbase. Great for proxy, the way I have it currently set up with the slap motors, mm, flies amazing. Only uses 20 by 20 stacks though. Again, only 20 by 20 stacks in this guy. I've had a lot of people ask me, what's the big difference? That's the big difference. 30 by 30 stacks, 20 by 20 stacks. I prefer 30 by 30 stacks primarily for the dependability and durability, although I've been having a lot of great luck with that stack. It uses the T-Motor Mini F7 HD flight controller with the new F60 uh, 60 amp ESC that just recently came out from T-Motor, the 20 by 20 format one. Been having a lot of really good luck as far as durability in that one, but I really love this stack. This is the T-Motor F7 HD stack that comes with the 55 Amp Pro 2 ESC. I've been flying this for quite a long time, well before I was ever sponsored by T-Motor. I've had nothing but great luck with this style. I have a lot of the flight controllers still that use the MPU 6000 gyro, which is in this quad. And this one is one of the newer ones that uses the BMI 270. Real quick, BMI 270, I think I've gotten just as good, if not maybe even a better tune from this gyro this flight controller on this quad that I have with my MPU 6000s. Anybody tells you that the BMI 270 gyro was no good, they're completely full of shit. They just probably don't know what they're doing. Um, I don't really do anything different as far as my tuning fundamentals. This quad in particular just has almost no filtering at all because it doesn't really need it. And because of that, it flies super smooth, really clean. Very happy with the flying characteristics. In terms of motors, I'm a huge fan of the Pacer V3s. Ever since the very first time I got a chance to fly them, T-Motor sent me a few of them to try out with the P49436 props, and I think the combination is spectacular with the 2080 KVs, 2207 Pacer V3s. Just completely changed my mind as far as what I was liking at the time, so I definitely wanted to stick with those. But the original Pacer V3s that came out used to have the Pacer portion also cut out of the bell, just like the P is right here. And what I noticed after flying them for a few months, you really banged them, dinged them up pretty good, the magnets would like fall out. And that was a fucking problem. So I actually provided that feedback back to Team Motor as well as a lot of other pilots in the community, as long as a lot of their other team pilots, and they made a change. And I'm really happy that they did because this version of the Pacer V3s that doesn't have the cut out there is just significantly more durable because of it and you still get that amazing, great feeling. The smoothness, the power, just the longevity of the motors is really solid. You know, the, the actual copper windings and all that, really well coated, so I have not had any issues with like burning these motors up like I've had in the past with other motors. So yeah, huge fan of these motors in particular. Now, if you're looking for something on a little bit more of a budget, I have to say that the Black Friday motors are phenomenal. These are actually only $20 a motor, they were, I thought they were just gonna be like a special edition for just purely Black Friday, but T-Motor is actually gonna keep these around for a while. So don't be worried about you know them restocking or anything like that. I love the color options. I actually am a big fan of the silver just because it goes with so many different kind of color schemes. But the blue is also pretty dope if you're into that. 1950 KV I think is a really good sweet spot for 6S. For those of you guys who wanna try something a little bit higher KV. And I've been told by Team Motor that they're made with the same quality of you know, magnets and copper windings and all that stuff as the Pacer V3s. So at $20 a pop, it's pretty tough to beat that. These are some really solid motors I've been having some really great luck with and I'm very much enjoying flying them on this quad. For my radio and receiver link, I absolutely love the Radio Master TX-16S Max. This is using the AGL-1 gimbal upgrade. Phenomenal radio. Anybody who's ever flown this radio will immediately know that this is just a quality feeling radio in your hands. Love it. I've tried a lot of different radios. I started with smaller gamepad style controllers because I actually started with the DJI FPV Remote Control 2 controller because I started with the DJI FPV drone. And I thought I was gonna want something smaller, but I, you know, I've got bigger hands. And the more I kind of flew, I realized I want something bigger and bigger. I did the TBS Mambo as an example, kind of moving up in size. And finally, eventually landed on the Radio Master. And I love this radio. If you guys haven't had a chance of flying with a good quality radio, it really does change up the game. It was a big difference for me in my flying and really starting to kind of push to have a nice, solid gimbal feel. 
and a radio that you can depend on. I do fly TBS Tracer. You can thank Mr. Steele for that. I've been flying Tracer since the beginning. I've tried Crossfire. I've tried ELRS before. Um, it was kind of a pain in the ass when I was trying ELRS. This was like kind of back when it was sort of not where it is now. It's definitely gotten better. I understand that. Um, it was kind of overly complicated when I didn't feel like it needed to be. And there wasn't a huge benefit. I actually really like Tracer because of the fact that it's just by nature, it's diversity. And that kind of leads me into my next topic. People I see flying Tracer don't do it right. I hate to say that because of course you can do whatever you want. It's your hobby. But the purpose of diversity with TBS Tracer is you want to have the antennas on different planes of just different perpendicular axes to each other. So you want to have one that is in you know one plane and then the other one on the opposite plane perpendicular to the other one because that is how diversity is essentially supposed to work. And I've had great, great quality and great luck with TBS Tracer. I've never once had an any single issue with it ever fail safing on me other than time when I've already lost video signal anyways. Um, that was the only time I've ever had. Actually, it, was, it wasn't even a fail safe. It was just the fact that you know I couldn't see anything so I couldn't fly. Uh, my video signal gave out. So other than that, I've never had any issues with TBS Tracer. I like the fact that it is a faster link than Crossfire. I have Crossfire on other quads. I've tried it on freestyle builds and just didn't like it. I do run it on my GIP RC Cinelog 35. I also have it on this Cinewhip, this Luminar Cinewhip. But I can notice the latency in the control link more than I can notice the latency in my goggle feed. And I'll get to that in just a second. But I really like Tracer. Dependable for me, good quality. It is a little more expensive. You can get, you know, pretty solid ELRS receivers for cheaper. So that is a big benefit of open source. I like where ELS is going. I think it's great for a lot of people, but for me, I like TBS Tracer. If I ever have any issues where I'm concerned about range and penetration, I actually have Peter the Penetrator as an antenna that I can put on my radio that you know just screws right onto my module that I have here in my Radio Master. I've only busted it out maybe two or three times when I was flying at like a Brando, a big massive concrete building. And yeah, didn't even need it because I actually flew that same location with just this antenna and it was perfectly fine. I flew through the entire thing, never once had a fail safe with Tracer. So yeah, I've got nothing but good things to say about Tracer. As far as my VTX of choice, of course, DJI now has their O3 air unit and it's just completely unbeatable in terms of range of penetration. There's just nothing out there that even kind of comes close. Nothing compares. The picture quality in the goggles is just next level. You know, if you have the funds to spend on it, I definitely recommend. I do love the fact that there's a lot of competition right now in the digital market and in just the goggles and, and VTX market in general. I mean, even analog is really starting to step up and perform on a different level than it has in the past. And it all looks great and it's great to have options. I'm a big fan of the goggles too. It's amazing as far as how light and compact this unit is compared to the goggles V2. You know, I love the fact that you can just put the antennas down, throw them in your bag, and it doesn't even take up that much space. You know, I'm a huge fan of the FX HD strap, which I did not have to modify at all to make it work with these goggles. It just fits in there perfectly fine. I love having the battery right there on the strap itself. I use a smaller cable to plug it in because I hate having dangling things from my goggles. And I have a zip tie in there to make sure it doesn't just back out, which I highly recommend if you're not doing that, definitely do that. You know, spend the time to get the, the diopters and everything perfect to how your eyes are set. And once you do, if you guys didn't already know, you can just kind of like push it in and turn it and it locks it perfectly in place so it doesn't kind of slide back and forth or anything like that for your interpupillary uh, dimensions. And I love the OLEDs and yeah, the fit could be a little bit better. You know, it's not as comfy as my V2s with the aftermarket foam. So I'm definitely looking forward to some aftermarket foam for these. But overall, I think the benefit of these goggles is just phenomenal. I'm sure many of you guys have already noticed, but I still run a session on this thing. I think the Session 5 is still the king for freestyle in particular. You know, GoPro just handles dynamic range differently than any other camera, and it just looks so good, especially because when we fly freestyle, we go to a lot of different areas from, you know, light to dark transitions and all that stuff, and the GoPros just handle it so much better than the O3. That is the one major downside to the O3, and everybody knows that. I will say that the O3 is capable of getting some beautiful footage, especially in the right lighting conditions, you know, when the sun is out and nice and pretty, I can get some amazing footage with the O3. And in that particular case, I'll probably just rely on that footage, but now I have options, and I'm glad that I have options on this quad. Overall, the O3, its technology, range penetration, everything that goes into it just better. Quad Mula has designed a really neat session mount that I requested. I wanted a fixed uh, session mount as opposed to what they were trying to use with this sort of combination where they had like a, you know, a base with a separate uh, mount portion. 
And I was like, yo, I need a, I need a one piece for freestyle. It's just the only way to go. I actually really dig this mount. I think it looks super rad, but I actually spent the time along with my buddy, Mark McCollum to help me design this one. It's based off of using, you know, the base mixed with a different apex mount that I used to love flying my session with the apex. I took those two designs, I sent them over to Mark and he put this together for me. And this is just a completely different level of 3D print in terms of the session. I love the fact that I can still put the battery strap around there to kind of hold it in nice and snug. I've never worried about this thing ejecting and it's just so solid and just, yeah, I've had nothing but great luck with this mount. If you're interested in this mount, I can definitely put you in contact with Mark McCollum. He can get you hooked up. In terms of batteries that I choose to use, I've tried so many different types of batteries. It's pretty much you can name it and I've tried it. And I've pretty much landed on what I know that I like. I originally started with the CNHL black batteries. These are 100C, not a fan of low discharge packs. Hate me if you want, 100C is low discharge in my book. If it's not 120 or higher, it's low discharge and it just, you feel it, you know what I mean? But these packs aren't bad if you're looking for something nice and durable. And these honestly have lasted me quite a long time. So I'll give them that. But I've tried so many things, you know, tattoo our lines. I've even tried Bozy Lipo before they shot their own fucking credibility to shit. I tried those and they're meh. I've tried these ones most recently. The GMB packs at 1300 milliamp hours are pretty solid. I actually really dig the fact that they're high voltage. So you get a little extra flight time because you can charge them up to 4.35 volts. But I will say the one downside to high voltage packs that I've experienced, not just these packs, but I also fly those on my three inch build. I have the other GMB batteries, the 380 milliamp hour ones, but they're also high voltage. They work pretty great for the setup. But the same thing I've noticed with high voltage packs is that you really start to feel the battery sag towards the end of the pack. It's something that's super noticeable. In fact, I've noticed that on pretty much every other battery that I've flown, except for my personal favorite, favorite, favorite. I will say that, you know, a good nod goes to Dogcom. I think Dogcom does an amazing job with battery packs. They're super durable. You know, they offer a really good amount of high discharge that you can legitimately feel. As far as the overall weight, it's not too bad. These are definitely up there as far as one of my recommendations if you guys haven't tried those. My overall favorite pack right now though is the R-Line Tattoo version 5.0 packs. I absolutely love these packs because the 1200 milliamp hour I think is the sweet spot in terms of weight and then overall performance. Battery sag just doesn't exist with these packs. The flight duration you get out of even 1200 milliamp hours is just phenomenal when you compare it to something like a Bose Lipo shitty battery that doesn't feel like it lasts as long and then you feel the battery sag. There's the same discharge rate and all that, but I mean like these are even heavier. There's just no benefit to anything else that I've really tried. You know, Dogcom at least has its durability and the fact that they're really dependable. Um, so I'll give the, uh, you know, Dogcom that one. And yeah, the 1300 milliamp hour GMB packs are slightly lighter than the 1200 milliamp hour ones, but you really do notice that battery sag. And yeah, performance as far as it goes, as far as these ones compared to these ones, I really don't notice a huge difference in flight times which is weird because this is a lot less. This is also high voltage. You would think these last a lot longer, but yeah, I'm not noticing enough of a difference to say that these are overwhelmingly better. In terms of durability so far, I haven't been flying these long enough to really be able to say, but so far these have been keeping themselves together in the realm of durability. I wish these were higher discharge. 120 is something that I think I kind of noticed between 150 and 120, but yeah, best packs all around. Wish they were a little bit more durable. Um, other than that, I think Tattoo does a pretty good job and I'm a pretty big fan of these packs. The final icing on the cake for my perfect build is the Umagod Umagrip battery pads. These really do an excellent job of keeping the battery where it needs to be, which is right there on the quad. If you've ever had a really tough front impact and you're using any other battery pad, then you'll know that your battery has a tendency just to go slide right into the back of the GoPro and possibly do more damage, you know, unless you're using something maybe like a toilet tank. Um, but even then, I think that this style of battery pad is a must. You know, if you ever get in a situation where you have a battery eject because of this and you haven't used Immigrip, definitely give it a try. Far less ejects that ever happened using this. And yeah, you really want to try to keep that battery on the quad where it needs to stay. Immigrip is the way to go for sure. But that's going to do it for the video, guys. I hope you all have a wonderful day. If you have any comments and questions, please feel free to drop them down below. I'll answer every single one that I possibly can. And yeah, happy holidays. Happy flying. Take it easy.